Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Mindscape Podcast. I'm your host, Sean Carroll. And longtime listeners know that we do a lot of different kinds of topics here on the podcast, but there is a heavy dose of things like physics, biology, philosophy. But if you think back, the very first episode was with a psychologist, Carol Tavris. And we've had a couple of psychologists on since then, Lisa Feldman Barrett, Scott Barry Kaufman. What we haven't talked about on Mindscape is psychoanalysis. Psychology is just the general study of how people think, how they behave, and so forth, whereas psychoanalysis is the specific set of ideas, uh, a school of thought, if you will, founded by Sigmund Freud. And it's actually weighed down by association with a lot of Freud's ideas that, let's just say, aren't fully baked. You know, Freud was not right about everything. He was dramatically wrong about some things. So there's this sort of caricature of psychoanalysis uh, with things like the Oedipal complex that men want to sleep with their mothers, uh, penis envy that women have, and, and things like that, things that haven't held up over time. And in fact, I, w- I think it's safe to say that in psychology circles, there aren't a lot of uh, psychology professors who are in the psychoanalytic tradition these days. But psychoanalysis lives on in literary and certain philosophical corners of academia, uh, not as a way of necessarily being a clinical practice, although there is that, but as a way of thinking about human beings and how they behave in a way to sort of understand ourselves better. And that's what we're going to be talking about today. And to make things worse, today's guest, Mari Ruti, uh, is a professor in the English department at the University of Toronto. Uh, She is the only person in the world who I would trust (laughs) to talk to you, my audience, about these topics we're going to be talking about today. Because it's not just psychoanalysis. It's the particular kinds of psychoanalysis that are influenced and thought about by French theorists, most especially Jacques Lacan, uh, a famous French psychoanalyst and uh, literary critical theorist, etc. And these ideas, you know, again, I, I'm pretty sure that most of the folks here in my audience are not by nature sympathetic to these kinds of ideas. Isn't that like postmodernism and all this anti-science, anti-real world stuff? So what I ask you is to listen to the podcast that is in front of you because Mari is the best in the world at taking that set of ideas and making them clear and helping us understand which subset of that set of ideas are actually worth listening to. And you might not at the end come away buying it. That's completely fine, right? I don't ask you to buy it. The idea of Mindscape is that I don't even buy everything that people who I have on uh, are going to be talking about, right? Uh, I don't buy everything that Lee Smolin or David Chalmers actually says, but I respect what these people have to say. And if I don't understand the something, I want to give it a charitable, careful listen before I make my decisions. And if you at all are at all interested in understanding the set of ideas better and would like to think about it carefully and know enough about it to make your own judgments, you've come to the right place. You know, and, and actually, I'm even being too negative to say that. I think there are really good, really important ideas here that can influence how we think about ourselves in interesting ways. You know, in the middle of this episode, I asked Mari to indulge me a little bit, and I made an extended analogy between Lacanian psychoanalysis and entropy in the arrow of time and out of equilibrium physics. (laughs) And it may or may not uh, stand up to higher scrutiny, but it's the kind of thing I think is interesting and worth thinking about. And so with that in mind, let's go. Mari Rudy, welcome to the Mindscape Podcast. Well, thank you for having me. Um, it's really an honor to be invited. Uh, I'm very grateful to have this conversation with you. Sure. I think it's going to be a lot of fun because it is a bit of a departure. You know, I end up saying at the beginning of half of my podcasts, this is a departure from what we usually do. So maybe it's a little bit, uh, maybe I should just uh, qualify the the boundaries as, as wider away than they really are. But anyway, so the let's just dive into perhaps the most... The thing that's going to happen to the minds of the audiences when they hear uh, what we're talking about, which is the word psychoanalysis, right? I mean, this is a fraught word in the modern age. We we instantly think about 100 years ago, Sigmund Freud, patients on a couch, 
Freud telling them that if they're guys, they want to have sex with their mother. If they're women, they have penis envy or something like that. And a lot of this uh, has been the subject of enormous criticism over many, many years. Uh, and, and so much so that many people have abandoned it. But there's a bunch of people who want to say that there are valuable insights there uh, when we take some of these ideas and put them into a more modern context. You're one of those people. So, I mean, how about just starting with the general sales pitch for why we should take psychoanalysis seriously here at the first fifth or first quarter of the 21st century? Okay, so <clears throat> the entire time you were talking, I, I had to suppress my laughter because <laughs> I didn't want to laugh over you. <laughs> laugh away. We're all everything friends you here. Say, everything, everything you say is right. Um, I can just imagine uh, your listeners already like rolling their eyes at the very word psychoanalysis. And uh, I'm very used to this resistance because I teach the topic to undergraduates every year. So I get a new bunch of people every single semester who have only heard um, snippets about psychoanalysis and usually not, uh, not the good parts. So they know things like, you know, Freud used cocaine and they know about <laughs> penis envy and stuff like that, but they don't really know much about it. Um, but then I have to admit that, or I guess I, I should say I'm proud of the fact that within three weeks, I will have re-inculcated them. I will have indoctrinated them to the point that <laughs> my colleagues in the hallway start telling me to stop talking about some of the uh, concepts because apparently the students who are in my classes can't stop talking about the psychoanalytic concepts that I have mm. introduced them to in their other classes, which then drives my colleagues crazy. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I know how, how to break the resistance, but I'm not sure I'm able to do this uh, during this very pod podcast. Um, but I will just um, start by saying that there are actually a lot of academics on the level of professors and graduate students who are combining psychoanalysis with uh, usually with continental philosophy and contemporary theory. Um, and in some ways, it's difficult for us to think about a time before um, the current version of psychoanalysis took over the humanities and to some extent even the social sciences. Um, there was a period when it was like a complete no-no, uh, like serious academics did not take it seriously. But these days a lot of people in the humanities and even some in the social sciences do. Um, but it's a very specific version of psychoanalysis. Um, so... Um, I'm going to mostly be drawing on a, a French thinker, um, a post-Freudian psychoanalyst and theoretician called uh, Jacques Lacan. Uh, his last name is spelled L-A-C-A-N, in case no one has heard of him. But he's among the, uh, I would say, top like 10 most f famous French thinkers of the 20th century, which is saying a lot. Um, you can compare him to th people like Sartre or de Beauvoir, Derrida, Foucault, people like that. Um, and he was part of the revolution uh, that happened in the American Academy, in the humanities during the 80s and 90s when French theory kind of took the American Academy um, like, uh, like a big wave, um, like a storm. Um, and there was a lot of resistance, but also, there, like I said, there's like kind of no going back to the pre-psychoanalytic moment um, because it did transform transform so many fields. Uh, sorry, I know that you're right in the beginning of, uh, of this, but let me just, just again, so we can orient the audience. Um, and I, I've resisted this, but I, I think that there's a lot of people out there who maybe don't know about the resistance, but there's this feeling, this caricature that that exact uh, wave of French influence of sort of postmodernism and post-structuralism that came to the U.S. in the 80s and 90s is all about just denying the existence of reality and saying there's no such thing as truth and you can't do anything. I think that is not where you're coming from, but maybe point that out or, or tell me that you are coming yeah. from Yeah. No, that's, that's a... Thank you so much. That's an excellent, um, <clears throat> excellent clarification uh, to ask for. Um, one reason that I'm uh, attracted to psychoanalysis specifically is that it's the one component of that so-called post-structuralist theory that did not give up on uh, a lot of things that I did not want to lose. I feel like post-structuralism, say Derrida and Foucault, those people, they got rid of things like truth and... Uh, also, like, in some ways, psychological complexity and psychological life, it became all about power and signifiers. It became very, very cold. 
like the human being just got um, kind of taken out of the equation, as did any understanding of uh, truth. And um, I mean, the psychoanalytic understanding of truth is very different from your understanding of it, but at least in Lacanian theory, there is such a thing. And it has to do with uh, the truth of desire, which I I can talk about later, mm-hmm. but uh, that's probably not the best <laughs> place to start right off the bat. Um, I do want to talk about desire, though, so we'll get back to that. But yeah, psychoanalysis uh, drew me specifically because it did not take away all those things that the rest of post-structuralist theory did. Um, and it's all, only really specialists who understand that there's a distinction between someone like Lacan and someone like Jacques Derrida. A lot of people lump them together, but um, those of us who study the field understand that they are coming from very different places. Well, and again, uh, yeah, that sounds perfect. Thank you very much for that clarification. The other thing that people are going to be uh, raising their hackles about is don't these people intentionally try to be impossible to understand? <laughs> and, yes. and I know that your whole thing, like the thing you're famous for, is making these uh, impossible to understand things understandable, which is why we have you on the podcast and not the ghost of Jacques Lacan. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I, 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 do, I, I do have the reputation for being like the one lucid Lacanian, um, <laughs> the one person who can... Well, there are others, but people often email me and say, oh, wow, I read your book and this is the first time I ever understand Lacan. Um, <laughs> he's one of the most incomprehensible. Uh, he's probably the most incompreh- com- incomprehensible of, the all, of, of, all of all of the incomprehensible thinkers in French theory. Uh, he is, like, when I... When I um, when I ask my graduate students to read one of his books, uh, they will come to class and say, I didn't understand any of this. I literally did not understand more than 5% of this. And that was my own experience also when I started reading him. But over the years, I've gotten pretty good at deciphering what he had to say. And okay, so the, the short answer to the question um, that you're asking, uh, it kind of has, well, it has two components. Post-structuralism, um, broadly speaking, was interested in um, subverting the idea that meaning is transparent. Mm-hmm. So they started writing intentionally in this completely incomprehensible, aggravatingly opaque way to make people struggle with uh, the idea that they could understand everything that they read. So that's one component, kind of a political, ethical component. And then, with, and that had to do with like taking down uh, Western epi- epistemological models that were uh, you know, centered around a certain type of clarity and certain type of uh, logical reasoning. But then when you come to Lacan himself, um, it also has to do with the fact that he intentionally wanted to speak the language of the unconscious, which is basically gibberish, (laughs) which is why many of his lectures sound like complete gibberish. So you have to kind of allow yourself to enter into that space of the unconscious to understand anything that he's saying. It's very intuitive. Um, and if you're trying to kind of go at it with logic in mind, you're never going to, you're not going to get anywhere, but yeah, that's a really good question. Okay. I'll let you resume the psychoanalysis, um, glossary. Okay. So I wanted to say right off the bat that, um, I am not interested personally. I'm not, I'm not interested in things like gender and sexuality and the Oedipus complex and penis envy and stuff like that. I think that those are outdated concepts, um, I'm also not interested in claiming that psychoanalysis is some sort of a science (laughs) because, uh, I mean, Freud was a neurologist before he became a a psychoanalyst. And I know that there is some work in contemporary uh, neuroscience that is drawing connections to Freudian thought in interesting ways, but I'm not an expert on those. Um, For me, uh, psychoanalysis is kind of a philosophy of everyday life. It's a, a mythology of human ontology, what it is that makes us who we are, what causes us to behave in the ways that we behave. Um, So think of it as a mythological thing rather than Mm -hmm. an attempt to give you a scientific basis for anything. Take it uh, with a grain of salt. Um, At the same time, it has incredibly, um, like, in my opinion, really insightful points to, uh, to make about Um, human beings and everyday life. And I'm just going to mention three points really quickly. And then hopefully you can uh, prompt me (laughs) with further questions. Um, 
So the, the things that most interest me about Lacanian theory specifically, and also more broadly psychoanalysis, but he does have a specific take that I can also talk more about in a bit. But um, the three things that I take from his theory specifically um, are, first of all, the fact that he understands he understands human ontology to be based on this sense sense that we are lacking something, mm-hmm. that there is this emptiness or hollowness or um, nothingness within our being. And as you know, uh, people like Jean- Jean-Paul Sartre had the same idea. I mean, his famous book is called Being and Nothingness. So Lacan is not the only person to think in those terms, but he had a very good explanation for why we we feel like that, uh, why, we, why we feel like we have lost something kind of unfathomably precious that we cannot get back. And that, and then the idea is that because of that lack, we have desire. And because of desire, we try to seek all kinds of ways of filling that lack, um, including things like writing books or creative endeavors <laughs> or other intellectual endeavors or whatever it is that makes human life um, sort of um, meaningful to people. Hosting podcasts. So that's the first. Hosting podcasts. Sorry? Hosting podcasts is what makes life meaningful, I think, here in 2021. That's a really good... Okay, so you are... That's your way of filling your life. Filling my life. You also have done it in many other ways, like (laughs) writing a gazillion uh, books, uh, as I have. So we have that in common. (laughs) But that's definitely... I I know that that's like my pathology. That's my symptom. Writing books is my symptom. It's the only way I can deal with the ontological nothingness. Um, Okay, that was the first point. Second is that... um, Lacan came to the conclusion that unlike during Freud's time, we are no longer living in a society of repression. So Freud talked about sexual repression and how we become symptomatic when our sexuality is repressed in various ways. And Lacan was like, because he was writing in the 50s, 60s, and 70s, and he was like, that's no longer the case in our society. Uh, Our problem is actually the the, um, opposite, meaning that we are inundated with enjoyment, what he called enjoyment, and we have just like almost too many sources of enjoyment available to us. Like every every possible kind of porn is available to us on the internet. So it's not like our sexuality is repressed. Uh, rather, we're kind of overwhelmed by the abundance of possibilities for satisfaction. Okay, so that was the second point. And then the third, and I'll say this quickly because there's a lot here to unpack, but... Um, I think that psychoanalysis is really excellent at explaining, like any psychoanalysis specifically, is really excellent at explaining uh, various components of everyday life, such as desire, love. This is how I hook my students right away. I start <laughs> talking about desire and love, and they're like, oh, please give us, give, give us more. <laughs> Trauma, loss, alienation, mourning, melancholia, depression, and also, importantly, um, the way in which we tend to repeat hurtful patterns of behavior even when we really don't want to repeat them we keep Mm. doing it anyway we tell ourselves that we're gonna change our way of doing things but somehow we can't and uh psychoanalysis is good at explaining that uh through um what freud already theorized as the repetition compulsion okay i will pause there and give you a chance to speak (laughs) Applying for jobs can be incredibly stressful, but hiring people can also be stressful. Getting the right people into your organization can make or break whatever it is you're trying to do. That's where Indeed comes in. Indeed is a job site that makes hiring incredibly simple. With Indeed, you do all your hiring in one place, attracting, hiring, even interviewing. Indeed's hiring tools help you cut through the noise to hire faster and smarter. In fact, Indeed Instant Match provides a list of quality candidates whose resumes are on Indeed the moment you post a sponsored job. With Indeed assessments, you can choose from over 135 skills tests to help make sure you're finding applications from people with the skills you need. Join more than 3 million businesses worldwide that use Indeed to hire great talent fast. And you can get started right now with a $75 sponsored job credit to upgrade your job post at Indeed.com Mindscape. That's a $75 credit at Indeed.com Mindscape. Offer valid through September 30th. Terms and conditions apply. Go to indeed.com slash Mindscape. Yeah, no, I mean, there's a there's a tremendous amount there, and I hope we're going to get a chance to go through all of it. But before we dive into these specifics, with with those points in mind, let, you know, let's say a little bit more about 
the general angle that we're taking here. I mean, I like it that you said very explicitly, you're not pretending to be a scientist, right? That was one of the criticisms of Freud in particular, is that he really, really, really wanted to be taken seriously as a scientist. And the, the fellow scientists are like, eh, predict something that, <laughs> that I wouldn't have been able to predict otherwise. Uh, otherwise, I'm not going to take you too seriously. But if you reformulate the approach as more of a I'm not even sure if it's a philosophy of life, but as a set of insights that are relevant to the philosophy of life, then it seems to make more sense to me. It is, and that's why, one, maybe one of the reasons why it was very popular in literature and English departments as opposed to philosophy or neuroscience departments. Um, and it actually, for other reasons, I've been reading, uh, don't take me too seriously here because it's not very deep reading, but I've been reading some early Chinese philosophy. And, you know, these people are very brilliant and, and the Warring States period and Confucius and uh, Zhuangzi, etc. But, uh, but they're not the sort of setting up systems of logic or political ethics that we, that we think of as the standard Western version of philosophy. It's much more like living your life. And maybe part of this is just reclaiming the idea that understanding how to live your life is a very valuable endeavor. Absolutely. <laughs> First of all, I should say that uh, Lacanian theory has very um, deep connections to Eastern philosophy. The whole idea of being built, being uh, being kind of built around a void or nothingness that's um, central to a lot of Western, I mean, sorry, Eastern philosophy. But yeah, um, I do like to think about it as a philo philosophy of uh, everyday life. And when cab drivers inevitably ask me what I <laughs> what I write on or what I teach, I tell them that um, I work on the meaning of life. And then they ask me, what is the meaning of life? And I say, well, the meaning of life is that there is no meaning. Yeah. <laughs> so that's, <laughs> that's usually how the conversation goes. However, I, even though the, in some ways there is no meaning, there is a, a, a lot of like bits of meaning to be drawn um, from this particular way of looking at the world. Um, and one thing I, I forgot to mention in my introductory uh, comments that I do want to get out is that when Lacan started writing in the 1950s, um, in it, and uh, he also started giving annual uh, lecture series, um, uh, and they went on for like 30 years. And initially, he had a very tiny audience that was composed of such just specialists. But he very quickly uh, developed a reputation in Paris. So in the 1960s and 70s, when Paris was really uh, like the Paris Parisian intellectual community was generating a lot of really interesting ideas, philosophical ideas. And in, in their view, psychoanalysis was part of philosophy. So during the, those two decades, um, pretty much anyone who was anyone in the Parisian intellectual scene, in the humanities and some of the social sciences, attended his lectures, which became huge. And so he had an impact on a whole generation of French thinkers that came just slightly after him. Like he was, he was kind of petering out in the late 70s and people like Derrida started writing mm. in the late 60s. So he influenced the whole generation of thinkers and it, uh, that influence had a lot to do with that notion of lack uh, that I keep referring to. Do I remember correctly the anecdote that Lacan at some point uh, came to give a lecture and then once everyone was assembled, he just stood there silently for an hour and then he left? Is that a true story? <laughs> yes, yes, absolutely. So he has <laughs> he has a reputation for being a, a troublemaker, a maverick, uh, just kind of a crazy person. He would also do things like throw items at the audience members, <laughs> like books and uh, pens and pencils and stuff like that. And mm. uh, toward the end of his life, when he was becoming very interested in math, and you laugh at this, and I know that. Uh, this is a part of Lacan that I don't really touch except for the content because I don't understand any of his, his mathematical equations, but his very late work is full of math, mathematical equations. And uh, when I talk to specialists who under actually understand math, they claim that they don't really make any sense, which I understand because also his written text doesn't make any <laughs> sense. <laughs> but, uh, Why should the but math? Yeah. The reason I'm talking about this is that he came to New York City, I think it was New York, um, to give a major talk 
and he stood on the stage playing with knots because he was interested in knot theory and math at that point. And so he didn't say anything. He was just standing there and playing with these knots with like ropes and stuff like that. And finally, his audience just kind of gave up and left. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, he was yeah. he was an eccentric, <laughs> a brilliant eccentric. It does remind me. This is completely non-substantive and just silly, but it reminds me of the story about Derrida, who gave a talk uh, at some point. Uh, uh, it, was, it was in the United States, so he was speaking in English, not his first language, and he was always apologetic about his English. And he, for some reason, he was given this entire talk about cows. And the whole audience is like, why, why is he talking about cows? Like, I don't know what cows have to do with what he's saying. And then, you know, he ends the talk and then uh, it's the, the question period and he talks to the organizer or whatever, the moderator, and, and then he comes back to the microphone and says, I'm informed it is pronounced chaos. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's perfect. No one knew. Makes perfect sense. Yes. So you have, to, you have to do some exegesis. You have to do some little work here. But... Good. So, yep. uh, yeah, two more points I wanted to sort of you sort of big picture points before we get into your into your more details. One is the idea that even though you're not claiming to be a scientist and, and you're not following Freud in that way, um, there clearly is science that is relevant here. Uh, right. We've learned a lot more about neuroscience than we have learned before. And the specific point that you raise. Uh, th that reminded me of that was the uh, repetition compulsion instinct, whatever it is. Uh, what do I call it? The repetition compulsion? Yeah, that's right. Okay. Um, that's something that is absolutely, you know, based in neuroscience. And in fact, I had a, a very interesting podcast with Robin Carhart Harris, who uses psychoactive drugs, uses LSD and other things to help treat those kinds of things. So I'm a believer that sort of both approaches are valid. I mean, if we understand these things qualitatively and can sort of come to grips with what's going on, that's valid. And if we understand what is going on in the neurons, that's also helpful. Yeah, that's that's really great. And so now I'm going to go back to Freud because, I mean, one of his kind of ground groundbreaking ideas that I think is still relevant today is that he had this idea that our uh, bodies or our drive energies have been wired in specific pathways mm. and um, it's possible for those pathways to become really fixed and that's part of what he meant by symptomatic behavior and that's par partly what he meant by the repetition compulsion you're kind of hardwired to repeat I mean like mentally hardwired to repeat certain kinds of uh, actions, but also like on a, on a physical level, like um, I'll use myself as an example. You know me pretty well. Uh, I've always been someone who has an excess of energy. Uh, Lacan calls this jouissance. It's just a French word for like pleasure, uh, but it can be pleasure that is so intense that it's kind of painful. And uh, so um, basically uh, Freud already had this idea that, you know, your our pathways of energy, jouissance, whatever you want to call it, are um, configured in specific ways. And the whole point of psychoanalysis as a clinical practice, like when people go to analysis for years and years and years, is to reconfigure those pathways, mm. is to break the, the usual pathways and create new ones. And that absolutely has to do with neuroscience. And I wish that I knew more about the current research that is being done in the field, uh, because I know that there is a lot that is being done that is uh, uh, that is explicitly comparing psychoanalytic um, findings to neuro uh, current neuroscientific findings, and I know that they are finding interesting overlaps. I just don't know enough about neuroscience to be able to speak to any specifics, but I do know that the the breaking of those patterns and then the breaking of those kind of pathways through your body yeah. and your psyche was at the chest of what Freud was trying to accomplish. Yeah, no, it sounds like there's a lot of uh, fruitful things to be thought about there. Okay, and the final big picture uh, question or point I wanted to raise was um, when you talk about the existentialist uh, sort of angle here and the uh, I don't know. It's not really nihilism or despair, but it's a search for meaning when when meaning has been lost to us. So this 
uh, circles back to questions of atheism and religion and things like that, right? I mean, is part of the need for this analysis that we now live in a world uh, where God is dead and we need to, I mean, I, I'm certainly a big uh, proponent that we need to construct uh, not only purpose and meaning, but also morality and ethics and things like that. And this is part of that overall project. Is that fair? Yeah, that's really fair. I mean, I agree with you uh, on everything that you just said. Um, and I think that uh, on some level, what at least Lacanian psychoanalysis is trying to do is to allow us to figure out how to deal with that lack within our being without resorting to some sort of a theological or otherwise sort of otherworldly explanation or an attempt to uh, cope with it or even cure it. You know, the, it makes perfect. Okay, so if we start from the premise that he gives us, meaning that we feel like there's this void within our being, then you can see how religion would be an incredibly mm. seductive um, ideology. Uh, the the idea of, of, of an afterlife where you kind of reward it for your present suffering, it's an incredibly seductive way to deal with that lack. And I think a lot of people do. Um, deal with it that way. However, what is distinctive about Lacanian analysis, and this is why he, he's beloved by a lot of academics in America, but uh, he's not really popular with a lot of American clinicians because he basically argued that um, that the best way we can handle this sense of lack is to acknowledge that there is no cure for it. Mm that we just have to learn how to cope with it. And the idea was that as, as soon as you acknowledge the impossibility of a cure, you could actually start devoting your energies to things that m make your life meaningful. And I mentioned writing books, uh, you mentioned podcasts, uh, but I mean, not everyone, not everyone is an intellectual or an artist, you know, painting paintings and writing books and stuff mm -hmm. like that. Uh, people have various ways of uh, finding meaning in their lives uh, that are sort of uh, more everyday than what we intellectuals do. But the point is that he was trying to give his patients and also his audience members the ability to think about how to make their lives meaningful without resorting to the idea of God. Right. Uh, that said, he was very knowledgeable about Christianity and I think was born Catholic, but he was still an atheist. Um, so it, it's a complicated relation to religion, uh, but definitely like a secular, uh, secular attempt to deal with this nothingness within our being. And to understand this nothingness as a kind of a springboard for everything that is meaningful about human life, including desire and love and our capacity to connect with other people. I can explain all of that in more detail if you want, but it was kind of like this idea that the lack was not our enemy. It actually was right. the, the foundation of everything good about human life. So actually, uh, that's exactly what I do want uh, to hear you expound on a little bit more. But if you will indulge me for a minute, uh, I want to propose an analogy, or maybe it's even an equivalence with uh, physics concepts here, because just that's okay, how I, now I'm really scared. Yeah, no, that's how I think <laughs> about the world. Um, and but, but 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 I'll creep up on it by talking a little bit about Antonio Damasio, who is a previous uh, guest I had on the podcast, and he's a neuroscientist. Uh, and so his way, his his big words are homeostasis and feelings. Uh, and what, what he means by this is, so when I translate that into physics terms, what he means by this is this, you know, if you have a box of gas, this is a typical physicist move, you have a box of gas, you let it reach equilibrium, it becomes comes to a temperature, and it'll just sit there forever. Like if you seal the box away from the outside world, it's fine, it's going to stay in exactly that condition for all time. But we human beings or any living living being, we're not like that. We're not equilibrium systems that we can seal off. Like if you seal us off, we will die. <laughs> and at the very fundamental physiological level, we need food and we need air and we need uh, things like that. And then so this is what Damasio is talking about. Homeostasis is the attempt to more or less regulate our physiology into its proper zone 
Um, but it's something that needs to be an active process. It, it won't. You, you need to get fuel. You need to get the right kinds of stimulation, etc. And to me, the psychological version of that. There, sorry, there is a psychological version of that also. Uh, and this is where feelings comes in. He, you know, he his word for feel. The reason why he cares about feelings rather than emotions is he thinks of feelings as the sort of more primitive impulses that your body and brain are giving you to saying something's not quite right. Let's fix it a little bit. Right. The this deviation from homeostasis. Stasis. And so, like, so, so the physics lingo is human beings are out of equilibrium systems. We, we have some more or less steady state, but it's like, in my analogy, it's like you're a surfer riding a, ra- a wave. It's not like you're a rock on the beach. You need to continually do little adjustments, right, to make sure you don't fall off. And so that's why, so coming back to what you've said, sorry for, uh, for taking over a little bit, but um, that's why I like this emphasis on the fact that we shouldn't be seeking the once and for all cure. That's like saying we should be seeking the state of being where we don't eat anymore, right? Uh, we are constantly going to be lacking something, driven to sort of fulfill some extra desire. We're not we're not reaching a state of perfect happiness, uh, and that's okay. That's part of the process. Once you realize that human beings are out of equilibrium systems, so. What about that? That's my question. (laughs) (laughs) Well, okay. Once again, I agree with everything you said, if I understood it correctly. And that's a really interesting way um, of thinking about uh, the matter. I mean, so to translate this into like psychoanalytic terms, when, uh, when people go to analysis, it's usually because they feel like they are off balance. They are out of equilibrium in one way or another, and they are seeking to figure out how to fix that. I mean, most commonly they go in because they feel like they're not being loved or they're not being loved in the right way. Mm -hmm. But anyway, uh, something is off kilter. And um, so a lot of the process, because psychoanalysis, uh, it's not the most efficient. I was going to say this when you talked about neuroscience, because I know that the neuroscientific solutions uh, and like cognitive um, behavioral adjustments are much faster and more efficient. Uh, Psychoanalysis is very inefficient in the sense that it takes years. Um, But the point is precisely to uh, gradually uh, make sure that you maintain uh, a degree of, or at least first, first of all, you introduce a degree of equilibrium into the patient's kind of psychic and bodily existence. And that, that then you kind of, I think in the process, what's supposed to happen is that the patient, the client, learns how to self-regulate. So the end of analysis is basically when you're able to do it yourself. You don't need the analyst's help to to reach a certain degree of equilibrium in the understanding that you're always going to lose it. You're never going to be able to hold on to it permanently, like you just said. And the trick is precisely to be okay with that and to give yourself the permission to be fine with that at the same time as you seek as as much as you can uh, a certain degree of uh, like comfort zone or equilibrium. Like I mentioned earlier that I have this huge excess of energy and my struggle is constantly to contain it and like uh, um, kind of tame it uh, to a certain degree. And uh, going to analysis, actually, the Lacanian analysis helped me learn how to do that in a better way, which then did things like reduce the amount of physical pain that I was in, Mm. uh, which was a symptom of like this over agitation. And so, yes, that all of that makes perfect sense and has uh, obvious um, like analogies with uh, psychoanalytic thinking. This overabundance of energy is just not the problem that I'm faced with in my life. I'm sorry that, you know, that's, <laughs> it's, it's a good reminder that people are different from each other. We have all of our own little issues. Um, but so good. So then uh, I want to hear more about these lacks. Um, you know, so I understand the abstract idea. I mean, there's the danger that it's just too general and too broad to be useful to say, well, there's something you don't have and you want it. Mm -hmm. Okay. I mean, that's a pretty, that's a pretty general thing. Like how much, how much more specific can we be about the kind of lacks or the origin of these lacks that are relevant to typical people trying to get through the world? Okay. Okay. Great question. Um, the first thing I want to say is that I, uh, in my own work, which is different from the work of 
this is one of the differences between uh, my work and uh, the work of some other Lacanians is that I tend to focus on two very different levels of lack. I want to distinguish between what I'm calling ontological lack, uh, kind of constitutive foundational lack that is uh, supposedly universal to human beings. Um, that's on the one hand. And then on the other hand, there are all kinds of context specific context-specific or circumstantial forms of lack that people are like wounding that people suffer from various kinds of injury that may be systemic like racism or poverty or sexism or maybe like idiosyncratic to you having to do with say your uh, upbringing your family mm -hmm. maybe you had a traumatic upbringing as a child stuff like that and that's a different level of lack from the ontological uh, version that Lacan usually focuses on so that's kind of the preface. And then I guess um, um, if you want to, if, if I, if it's okay, I'll dig a little deeper about how he comes to that understanding of lack as the foundation of existence. Yeah. I mean, he basically, and uh, this is just like the Cliff Notes version of uh, the, the gist of Lacanian theory on human ontology. The idea is that when the infant is born into the world, uh, it's born into a world of signifiers of meaning when i mean when i say signifiers i don't mean just language but but also like nonverbal cues uh smiling and how people hold the infant and stuff like that um but uh a lot of these meanings uh, pre-exist that that i mean almost all of them pre-exist the infant's arrival in the world and one good example is gender where sometimes parents um unless they are very you know forward looking they paint their nurseries different colors depending on whether they are expecting a boy or a girl they will buy different toys depending on whether it's boy and a boy or a girl so that's a really clear example of how signifiers in some ways determine the child's um, being on some level even before it arrives into the world and uh, then the idea is that once the when once the child starts to learn how to speak and starts to understand language Language is key, key for here. Language is really key for Lacanian theory. His idea was that once the child starts to speak, it quickly comes to realize that it's actually not the center of the world uh, because before language, there's just there's no distinction between the world and the child. The child is sort of the entire universe, the entire world. Uh, but once there's language, there's suddenly me and there's you and there are like objects in the world. And that is what he thought was the, the kind of the source of the feeling that we have lost something unfathomably precious, that we have lost this sense of plenitude, of being whole. Suddenly we are no longer whole. Um, and once that happens, uh, the desire to fill that, that uh, void kicks in and you start looking for various ways to, to fill that um, fill that void, fill that nothingness. And as I said earlier, his idea was that uh, the best thing you can do is to just learn to live with it rather than try to heal it. Um, so that's the really, really short uh, version of why he thought that we are the way we are. And that's different from, that make, that immediately makes us different from uh, other, like, other animals. Um, I think that Lacan would have agreed that humans are animals on, on various levels, but because of this sophisticated uh, usage of language and uh, signifiers that we have, he um, he implied that we are, and I'm using wording from a fellow Lacanian, Todd McGowan, <laughs> who says that uh, human beings are distorted animals. And that has to do with the idea that language has somehow meddled with our biology in such a way that we are no longer in a kind of pure biological state, but we have been distorted by uh, the culture that we, are bo we were born into and uh, that our feeling of like, okay, we're missing something. There's like a piece of me missing is a part of that distortion uh, that other animals presumably don't experience. We all spend a lot of time writing online, whether it's applying for a job or just sending something out to social media. And we're not always at our best when it comes to the wordsmithing. That's where WordTune comes in. WordTune is the first AI-powered online writing tool that actually understands what the words mean. I use WordTune when I'm writing emails. All you have to do is type in your draft, 
highlight a sentence, and WordTune comes up with suggested alternatives to how to structure those sentences so they are crisp, clear, and strong. All of us fall into ruts when we're writing. We use the same constructions over and over again. WordTune can help you escape those ruts. And WordTune works anywhere you're working online. Google Docs, Slack, Outdoor Web, WhatsApp, and more. And Mindscape listeners can try WordTune for free at wordtune.com slash Mindscape. If you're away from your computer, go to wordtune.com slash Mindscape on your mobile phone, enter your email, and they'll send you a link to make it easy to get started. So get help writing your emails, reports, presentations, resumes, and blogs today. Go to wordtune.com slash Mindscape. Part of that makes a lot of sense to me, and part of it uh, I, I can't quite sign on to, but maybe uh, I just don't know enough about it. The, the, this, the, this distinction between humans and other animals, there's something to that because, you know, I mean, animals can be happy or sad, they could be frightened or whatever. They don't get embarrassed that much, or they, they don't feel social anxiety in quite the same way that we do. They don't worry about the future in the same way that we do. And, and I, I've, I've sometimes discussed it not in terms of language, but in terms of our imaginative capacities to uh, think about the future, which is, which is part, which is wrapped up in the, in the whole language thing. So I think that there is something there that is very interesting and worth diving into even more. Uh, that what, I, what I'm more skeptical about is the story about uh, the baby. Uh, coming into the world and being surrounded by signifiers. I mean, clearly that's true. Um, whether or not, or, or let, let's put it this way, which aspects of my current or someone else's current psychological makeup can be traced to that occurrence in my infancy seems to be to be almost impossible to know. I mean, it's a it's a good story, but how would I know if that were true? And how would I know that there's some other story that isn't that isn't just as good? I mean, is is that part of the story crucial to the later insights, or is it more like a it's all part of a package and we can take and, and leave some different parts of it? Yeah, that's a really good question. <clears throat> I think I think that it is pretty foundational to Lacanian theory specifically. Um and I, th I mean, th I think that a lot of it is actually kind of intuitive in the sense that uh, a lot of people would come to analysis and, and complain about the fact that they feel like something is missing from their being, that they are feeling this emptiness or, you know, some uh, sort of alienation or a mal like existential malaise, mm. malaise or like dissatisfaction. And so I think he was looking for an explanation for that um, because other animals don't have like existential... I don't know, but it, it looks like, <laughs> it seems like they don't have existential anxiety and all of these worries about this and that. And so he was trying to uh, figure out why. Um, and, you know, like I said earlier, philosophers who were writing around the same time as he was writing and thinking came to the same conclusion uh, that there is this kind of a feeling of void that human beings seem to share. But they weren't really able to explain it. And so one of the things that Lacan was trying to do through that theory of, of language acquisition had to do with that attempt to explain why it is that we end up like that. And uh, yeah, so um, I, like I said at the beginning, this is, uh, I, I take all of this with a grain of salt. It is a mythology to me. Mm -hmm. um, I acknowledge that, that there could be all kinds of other explanations. Uh, but it also seems feasible that uh, once once the child begins to speak, it loses something. And one another way to think about this is that because because of the cognitive distinction between uh, very young children and adults, a lot of times children don't really understand what it is that adults want from them. <laughs> so uh, Lacan talks in terms of like enigmatic signifiers, the signifier that is coming at the child is enigmatic. Uh, the child can't process exactly what it is that the other wants, the other being the parent or the caretaker or whoever, what, is it, what, it, what it is they want from the child. And so that itself can lead to a certain degree of kind of unease or off, being off balance or in this, this equilibrium that you described earlier. Um, but yeah, no, I'm not asking anyone to believe this as some sort of a scientific uh, fact. It's definitely a theory. Um, and, uh, you know, there are other psychoanalytic thinkers like Melanie Klein who worked with very young children and infants. Uh, there are like 
child psychiatrists mm-hmm. and child psychoanalysts who arrived at, at similar um, conclusions using different vocabulary uh, from, Lac- from Lacanian theory. And that was th- um, those observations were based on actually like looking at how young infants um, react to stimuli coming from the outside world. Again, I'm not an expert on this, but I, I know that infant psychoanalysts have arrived at <laughs> some of the same conclusions. Interesting. But again, yeah. not a science. Yeah, Definitely not a, not a science. Okay, that's okay. <laughs> but uh, okay, good. So we have this lag. It may or may not come from... Uh, it's her, look, I, I completely think it's plausible that childhood experiences, imagination, language are somehow wrapped up in uh, these feelings that we have of, of lack and so forth. And it's good to have sort of a preliminary framework on which to hang our ideas is about it uh, with a footnote that it's subject to being updated, right? I mean, that's that's always going to be true. Um, so, but there's this this extra twist that you're going to put on it that says that uh, you know, following the advice of Beyonce, we should make lemonade out of uh, these lemons <laughs> that the world has given us, and that the lack is not just you know this, this idea that we're driven by our lacks is not a purely negative thing; that it leads to things like creativity and expression. Yeah, I mean um, that, and that's that is. I have to admit that that's particularly my way of reading uh, Lacan. There are other people who are much more interested in the more destructive sides of his theory, mm-hmm. and I have kind of built my particular reputation on um, this this tendency tendency to go in a more affirmative and and kind of. I don't know, sublimatory <laughs> direction. Uh, so I think that you can read Lacan in different ways. And the way I have chosen to read him is that he's basically saying that because we do have this sense of lack. And and I want to reiterate it, maybe reiterate it in one other way so that it's um, maybe more convincing to the skeptics. Um, you can think about it as a, as a form of wounding. Um, I... I, you could make the argument that pretty much all children are in one way or another wounded. Like no one ever feels like they are loved enough, even if they had great parents, like the best parents in the world. Like you can never feel the child's need for love. Um, so there's always a certain type of wounding. And then some some people have been much more wounded than others. So that's one way of understanding this lack. But anyway, so the idea is that like if you take it for granted that the lack exists, then the uh, obvious sort of next step would be to say, okay, well, what happens to human beings after that? And Lacan came to the conclusion that um, that from lack comes into being the desire to, f- to fill it with various activities. And there are basically two ways of filling it. Uh, we can either go into the world and find things like people, and of course, falling in love is one of the, we can talk about love if you want to, um, uh, because that's one of the topics I've written a lot about. Um, so you can you can fall in love, you can find a person who seems to feel that lack. That's really effective. That's one of the most effective ways of doing it, which is why a lot of people um, seek, I mean, if you take this theory seriously, this explains why we are so drawn to the idea that there's like a soulmate who's going to complete our mm. being and all that. We can find people or um, objects in the world or even like ideals that we hang on to as a way of like dealing with this lack. The other route to uh, dealing with it is to invent something, <laughs> invent, in, invent, you know, any do any kind of creative labor, um, intellectual labor, or I don't know, um, like be a uh, carpenter or something. Use your use your uh, skills in such a way that you can kind of either forget about that lack or at least cover it over. And the idea is that uh, a lot of a lot of us are really good at just like ignoring it most of the time. We make ourselves very busy and don't want to think about it, or um, don't really have space in our lives to think about it. Um, and something like poverty would make it very difficult to actually focus on mm. this sort of existential type of lack. Um, but if we, uh, the idea is that it, uh, if we are suddenly faced with something very difficult in our lives. Like if something traumatic happens to us, 
we often become very aware of it. Uh, so let's say you fall terminally ill or you have a horrible breakup or something uh, happens to you professionally that's just terrible, then that then it's difficult for you to avoid looking at that lack kind of in the face. And you, you can think all the way back to Nietzsche who talked about staring at the abyss. So this is not a new idea. Uh, he had this notion of staring at the abyss and having the courage to do so. Uh, so in some ways, Lacan is just kind of re-articulating this already Nietzsche idea of like, you just have to have the guts to look at the abyss in the, in the face rather than trying to find these ways of avoiding uh, it. At the same time as he very much advocate, advocated the idea that there are productive, meaningful, creative ways, sublimatory ways of of coping with it so that it doesn't overwhelm you and take over your existence and put you into a paralysis. What was the platonic dialogue that talked about the souls being separated and then you're trying to find them again? Was that the symposium? The, uh, yes, the symposium. And Lacan actually has a whole uh, le- lecture series, a whole book on the symposium. <laughs> symposium. So it was, <laughs> was Plato the first Lacanian because he emphasized this lack that we have that we're all looking for to find our, our uh, soulmate that has been wrested apart from us? Yeah, pretty pretty much. Actually, that's <laughs> kind of the gist of uh, one of my books. Uh, it's called The Summons of Love. and I, So it's about love. And uh, one of the arguments I make is that basically Lacan is kind of plagiarizing Plato. <laughs> um, and that is, it's this whole idea that, you know, Zeus divided those round beings like uh, like an egg with, an hair, with a hair. And then they were um, separated from each other for the rest of their lives and yearned for a reunion with their missing half. And then were like super happy, filled with jouissance, this exuberant happiness when they found each other. That's basically the Lacanian story, except that he's very skeptical of the ending. He's very skeptical of the idea that you can find your soulmate and everything will be, you know, just golden after that. Uh, So he doesn't buy that part of the story, but the rest of it is just, directly out of Plato. So yeah. good. So I'm, I'm on Lacan's <laughs> side and being skeptical about the ending, but as, you know, uh, marketing advice to would-be myth builders, the idea of Zeus and eggs and, and hairs is awesome. Like you got to have that uh, extra <laughs> bit of fantastical apparatus to really catch on and become popular, I think. But uh, I, I, wanna, I do want to get to love because, you know, I'm no better than your students who are going to fascinate about this, but I want to get the other things um, out of the way first. I mean, you... you touched on this fact that when we do talk about searches for ways to fill our lives, ways to address the lacks that we have, um, you know, look, writers and intellectuals, when they tend to be the kinds of people who write about searching for meaning in life. And guess what? They always say, well, you should do writerly intellectual things. <laughs> and But uh, I want to suggest, and you know, I want to hear whether you agree or not, um, there's a, an infinite number of ways that we can address this, and some of them might be very highbrow, and some of them might not be highbrow. I mean, you could be a fan of a sports team, or you could like gossiping with your friends, or just you know going to McDonald's or whatever. I mean, there's there's different sort of activities I can imagine that are perfectly valid, uh, that that are part of this. Yeah, you know, to to attach too much grandiosity to them, part of this human search for meaning. Absolutely. And that's one of the things that I always emphasize when I teach psychoanalysis, because I think the, uh, the, the popular understanding of uh, the Freudian understanding of sublimation has to do with very high brow endeavors, such as writing books or painting paintings or writing songs or, you know, other kind of really culturally revered activities. And I always tell my students that that's just the tip of the iceberg that very few people actually deal with their their existential crisis or their lack or whatever you want to call it in those ways and um i mean <laughs> I, uh, I mean there there are all kinds of ways in which you can fill your life you can exercise you can have children they are very 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 good distraction from your <laughs> from your lack i mean they take up a lot of space yeah. well, very distracting you can you can watch netflix you know you know for days at end which i do sometimes uh, you can uh numb your feelings with you know alcohol or drugs or whatever uh so there are more or less productive ways of of like to coping with it and i guess the 
the idea in psychoanalysis is to get people to use um, use avenues of filling their lives that are not pathological in um, in the normative sense, like are, are not self-destructive, are not bad for yeah. you. Like so, instead of like day drinking, uh, <laughs> uh, doing something that is a bit more um, like I don't know. I don't want to say productive because it sounds like um, like psychoanalysis is trying to like normalize people. And this is one of the big distinctions between other forms of psychoanalysis and Lacanian theory that I should have actually mentioned earlier. Um, and this is why he's not so popular with American clinicians, because most American clinicians are invested, invested in making the patient more functional, making... Uh, the person happier, uh, more adapted to social demands, whereas the goal of Lacanian analysis was to allow the patient to just like come to terms with the idea that they will never feel whole, and also to question everything, question norm, question norms, question social rules, rules and restrictions. Basically, and I hope that it's okay for me to work. Can I use the F word? Go ahead. We'll just Can mark I? you as explicit. No problem. <laughs> Because um, uh, I've actually used this in writing, uh, uh, the most succinct way to uh, explain what Lacan was hoping to do with his patients was to teach them to say "fuck you" to like societal demands. He was mm. not trying to normalize anyway, any anyone. So I don't want to say that you know <laughs> he he would have been invested in making sure that people are not day drinking, that they're doing something more quote unquote useful with their lives. But nevertheless, I, I, I guess I, I still have a little bit of, um, of an investment in the idea that there are more or less productive ways of like coping with this lack or malaise or traumatization or wounding, whatever you want to call it. Yeah, I mean, maybe, maybe you just said everything you have to say about it, but I just want to push harder on this because I haven't thought about it that much myself and I, am, I don't have a favorite answer, but... On the one hand, one wants to not be overly judgy about the different ways people have of dealing with uh, existential horror of reality. Um, and especially one doesn't want to just uh, valorize or privilege uh, my own ways of dealing with things so other people can have their things. But at the same time, you want to be able to say that within each individual and their situation, presumably there are, in some sense, better and worse ways of coping, right? Uh being a fan of a sports team is probably better than just drinking to forget your problems, uh, you know, at least if, if you don't become too fanatic about it. So what is that judgment? What is that hierarchy that we're putting it on? I mean, what is, what is the good versus bad way of, of addressing our lacks? <clears throat> okay, so now I'm going to open a total can of worms. Good. You you started this whole podcast by talking about truth, <laughs> which of course I would expect from you as a scientist. And uh, my answer to this is that Lacan was very invested in this idea that there is a truth to your desire, mm. um, and uh, he was hoping that analysis as, as a clinical practice would help you access this truth, which is often. Um, buried our under kind of layer upon layer upon layer of societal expectations. And so when he taught his patients or tried to um, teach his readers to, to kind of uh, resist societal norms, um, his, his um, objective was to get to something deeper about your desire. And so the idea is that if you can kind of locate the thing that most fulfills your desire um, in the hope that it's something that is not destructive to you, like day drinking, if you can locate that one thing or a few things that are most meaningful to you, then that would be the way to uh, kind of organize your life. It's a kind of a way of thinking about self-fashioning. Like Nietzsche had this idea of living your life as poetry. Lacan had, a, had the idea of like figuring out what it is that you truly want and then like following the thread of that desire. Now, you can obviously, it's like obvious that there are like huge problems with this because I mean, if your desire is to be a serial killer, <laughs> you're kind of in trouble. <laughs> so say. you don't really want to pursue the truth of that thread of desire. But, but you know, kind of beyond, beyond those kinds of extremes, he had this idea that um, if you could figure out what it is that, that really appeals to you. And he had actually like a term for this. Uh, he called it the 
objet A in French, uh, the object A, like the cause of your desire. If you could mm. figure out what the objet A, object A of your desire is, like the kernel of your desire is, then you can perhaps live a life that is that feels better to you, feels more meaningful to you, uh, not in the sense that you feel he healed, but in the sense that you feel like you're living the kind of life that you want to be living. So that is sort of the existential component, philosophical component of this. So so indeed, okay, so I get how it's a, it does come down to truth, that in some way, when you're trying to deal with your lack, there there are ways to truly address it, and then there are ways just to sort of mask it and hide away. And so we're going to... We're gonna, uh, count we're going to value those ways that are a little bit more truthful is that fair that's very fair and this is uh like i said when we started talking about truth um i say that that lacan had a very different understanding of truth from uh what i assume is your understanding uh, because um rather than looking for the universal truth with the capital t uh which in some ways he actually was because, I mean, he theorized the whole notion of lack as a universal mm. human condition and all of that. But but when, when it comes to like specific people, individuals, uh, his understanding of truth was actually really, it had to do with the singularity of your desire, the singularity of the, of the person. And here I want to distinguish between identity, which is sort of socially, socially constructed. It's your social persona that you present to the world. And then what, what I, in my work, ha have called um, the singularity of your being, which has to do with like a combination of your psychological life, but also your bodily drives and how you are in the world. And, um, and so for him, uh, or at least in my interpretation of him, the idea was to access something about the truth of the singularity of your being, and the closer you got to that, the closer you got to some sort of a truth, truth about your yourself. But that's completely different from, uh, you know, truth in in the scientific sense of the word, because it it implies that everyone's truth is like specific to them. Well, I can imagine that. I, I don't necessarily think it's incompatible. I mean, there there's a truth about. The fact that electrons and protons have equal but opposite charges, and there can separately be a truth about individual people. I mean, individual people are going to have uh, something that is different from person to person, but never less true about them. I think that's completely compatible. But the the slippery thing here is, and you know, it's just it's it's not your fault or Lacan's fault. It's the fault of what is to nature in to be a human being is that on the one hand. Yeah, what in me right now there are things that are true about me, and maybe I can try to sort of fulfill the desires, etc. But those are also malleable in some sense, right? Like part of me can change another part of me, and so it's not completely clear which parts I should hang on to and which parts I should I should work to change, right? Mm -hmm. Well, that that's uh, I mean that's that's really a great way to think about it uh, because I don't think that this truth of being, the singularity of being that I'm talking about is meant to be a static notion. Yeah. I said earlier that the the goal of analysis in some ways is to get, get you to the point where you can quote unquote do it yourself. You can kind of keep analyzing yourself. And the, so there's a process to your um, way of being in the world and your, uh, your singular way of being in the world. And I've written a whole book, uh, I guess most of my books actually talk about uh, subjectivity as a process that never comes to an end. You're always fashioning yourself. You're always reinventing yourself. New understandings of what it is that is important to you come to existence repeatedly, like um, continuously. So it's definitely not a fixed truth. And uh, I guess one way to think about it uh, psychoanalytically or clinically is, again, to get the the client or the patient, Annalisaad, to the point where they are okay with the fact that they are in constant process of becoming something that they don't mm. even yet understand themselves. Like you don't know what the what the end point is going to be. And that's really hard for some people. They're mm -hmm. looking for stability. And uh, this is a destabilizing theory in the sense that it wants you to become comfortable I guess it's in some ways stabilizing because it wants to, you to become comfortable with the fact that you are not going to be a stable creature, that you are always in the process of becoming something. 
There are some things you just can't do from the comfort of home. You can't go on a hike. You can't go see a concert. But what you can do is exercise. And with Peloton, you'll have a workout experience like no other without ever leaving home. One of the great things about Peloton is the feeling that you're in a community, that there are other people participating, struggling, and sweating along with you. So even though you have the convenience of being at your own home, you get the common feeling that everyone is in this together. From keeping up with close friends to enjoying world-class workouts with people around the globe, you'll never work out alone. You can hand out high fives on the leaderboard and join groups like Working Moms of Peloton or Tabata for Tacos. So with the Peloton bike, there's nothing like working out from home. Learn more at OnePeloton.com. New members can try Peloton classes free for 30 days at OnePeloton.com slash app. Terms apply. That's O-N-E. P-E-L-O-T-O-N dot com. Which, right, which reminds me that I wanted to ask about, you know, despite the fact that we want to not be too hoity-toity about uh, overly valuing intellectual, writerly sort of activities, there is a sense in which I think you say that this initial impulse of lack, of, of trying to fix something that we don't have or some desire that we have for something, can be a creative impulse, can actually be seen to be at the heart of uh, our more creative moments, if such moments are what we seek to have. Absolutely. I mean, that is that for me personally is uh, what is most important or precious about this theory. I mean, like any theory speaks to me theoretically, but it also speaks to me very personally. Uh, I was hooked onto it for absolutely personal reasons. <laughs> and uh, it had to do with um, this kind of a jump from a feeling of lack and alienation to the ability to create, to write. I mean, I used to have a huge writing block, a writer's block in grad school. You probably even remember it because <laughs> we knew <laughs> each other back, back, um, back then. And uh, for a long time, I couldn't write. And I went to analysis in order to be able to break that and it actually did work in the sense that I, I was able to start writing and I haven't stopped writing since uh, so and okay so I, I will, I'll, I'll give you an anecdote from uh, one of Lacan's books um, and uh, because it will sort of illustrate this really concretely he's actually talking about another analyst's text and uh, ultimately he says this is a completely crackpot kind of way of thinking about things but you know nevertheless there's something that we can learn from this um, this other analyst that he's talking about um, had a patient who had a brother-in-law who was a, a, a talented painter and had filled her walls with his paintings and then one day he came and took away one of the paintings. So this woman was left uh, in her apartment with this empty spot in the wall. <laughs> <laughs> and she was in analysis. And so apparently this other analyst claims that what happened was that she went and bought some paint and started painting herself and miraculously actually was able to paint a pretty good painting. Now, Lacan says, that's ridiculous. There's no way that this <laughs> woman would have ever been able to paint a good painting from like having never uh, attempted to paint. But the, the gist of it, the fact that, that, that she was kind of compelled to go out and buy paint and attempt to replace the, the empty spot on the wall was something that he could get on board with. He's like, okay, emptiness, we want to fill it. So we find if we have the intellectual or creative capacity, we can find creative intellectual ways of, uh, of filling that void or actually at least like coping with it better. But I mean, um, so what's yeah. the what's the programmatic advice that we have to people who who would like to be more creative, <laughs> like lack more? Or I mean, I'm not quite sure uh, how we get. <laughs> I'm just laughing at that program programmatic uh, advice because <laughs> I was like so anti antithetical to everything that Lacan stood for. Because I as I said, he, he basically spoke gibberish. But okay, go ahead. <laughs> yeah, I mean, so so I'm a, I'm a person on the street. Uh, I, I, I've. Uh, I don't know what my feelings about Lacan are, but I, I get this idea that uh, we're driven by our lacks, uh, even unconscious. Uh, can I attach the word unconscious to many of these things? So, but I'm I'm also writing a novel. I'm working on my novel finally, uh, and I want to be creative. I want it to be fun and, and and new and inventive. And is there a way to sort of use this mythology as you set up to sort of help me release my inner creative energies? 
<laughs> I'm, just, I'm just laughing because I have just co-authored a book on this very issue with a, a novelist. Uh, it's in dialogue format. Uh, me and the novelist, uh, her name is Catherine Quinton Brower. Um, complicated last name, um, Quinton Brower. Uh, Catherine. So we wrote this book in dialogue format and we talk about uh, the kind of uh, logistics of creativity and we're both coming from a Lacanian perspective. Um, she's trained in the theory as well, even though she's a novelist. And so um, the conclusion that we both came to independently of each other, and I invited to do this project with her, partly because I knew something about her writing process and I realized that it was very similar to mine. So I was like, okay, there's something uh, that we can talk about here because, you know, I, I have written 14 books, which is a lot. I know you have also written like a, a, a lot, but in my field, 14 books is a ton. Um, and so a lot of people ask me, you know, what is it that drives you? What is it? How is it possible that you can write all those books? And, and I realized that Catherine had the same um, kind of predicament of almost like overproductivity. And so we both came to the conclusion that uh, what needs to happen is that we somehow manage to, at the opening stages of starting to write, uh, we're talking about writing specifically, but this could also apply to other arts. Um, At the opening stages of writing, we purposefully kind of banish our egos to a different room or like a different, like a mini universe. We just tell, tell the ego to just like go away. And that (laughs) allows uh, space for uh, these sort of um, Hmm. physical energies and psychological energies that I've talked about, uh, that I've labeled as jouissance that are kind of coursing through our bodies to interact with the signifier, with the word in such a way that the signifier is um, filled with a certain type of new energy. It's filled with a creative, innovative uh, energy that is able to create something, uh, to, hopefully something new. So the kind of quintessential example is someone like James Joyce, who also wrote gibberish. And the idea is that, the Lacanian idea is that when James Joyce wrote, he was filled with this energy, this jouissance, that was kind of carrying his signifiers, carrying his words in such a way that he actually kind of demolished usual, usual language and was able to invent his own kind of language. Now, usually we don't all want to do that. We don't all, all want to write like James Joyce and write like <laughs> gibberish. But uh, there is, I think that there's a way in which we can release that energy in our, in our b- bodies and in our psyches that helps uh, allows our writing to kind of flow and allows us to kind of fly with our words. And that's something that I definitely experienced. Catherine, Catherine experiences. We kind of lose track of the, even lose lack of our surroundings. We can mm-hmm. lose ourselves in that um, for like hours. I mean, and I, I know that people who have called this place like the zone or the well that yeah. you go into and stuff like that. And that feels very visceral. And so Part of the, the Lacanian theory around lack has to do with that ability to bring the jouissance of the body, the energy of the body, together with the signifier in such a way that something new comes into being. And you can only do that if, if you're able to banish the ego that is sitting on your shoulder and telling you that you are not going to succeed, you're not going to be good enough, your prose sucks, you're just like a horrible writer. It means that uh, it basically means that you allow your, yourself to write whatever comes to uh, comes to you. I mean, sometimes I sit down and I write, I put my finger, fingers on the keyboard and things just start, like sentences just appear and I don't even know where they come from. And of course, the, the first draft is a complete mess, but I have come to uh, be able to live with the fact that it's a complete mess. And then that allows me to, to just write and write and write until I have a whole book length mess and then mm-hmm. I can take that mess and rewrite it into a book and then the rewriting process takes like months and months and months because it is such a mess <laughs> uh, but eventually it turns out in, into a it turns into a kind of a pristine pristinely written book uh, but the initial initial kind of um, um, rush of writing has to do with just like giving up control getting rid of the ego so that yeah actually 
that is some kind of programmatic advice there. And I hate to be the scientist, but it reminds me uh, of at least an analogy I mentioned before, um, uh, the neuroscience of psychedelics and, you know, what effects these drugs have on the brain. And one of the, one of the, the single most fascinating fact I learned about, about reading about these things is you would think that if you take something like LSD and then you see all these colors and whatever, that it is firing off neurons in your brain, right? That it's causing these things to be fired. But in fact, it depresses certain activities in your brain. It's just that what it's depressing is the gatekeeper. Like that these these sounds and, and light shows and whatever and ideas were bubbling beneath the surface all the time. And there's parts of your brain that sort of zero them out and, and, and keep them silent. And, and the taking the psychedelics lets them flow free. So maybe that's at least analogous to this, uh, you know, drug-free version where we learn to let our subconscious thoughts flow a little bit more freely. Yeah, no, I think that, first of all, you're totally allowed to be a scientist because that's what you are, <laughs> in addition to being being a philosopher and, uh, you know, just a <laughs> Renaissance man. Um, but yeah, that makes perfect sense. Uh, it's precisely, uh, I mean, you, you kind of nailed it. it. It's about getting rid of the gatekeeper or getting around the gatekeeper neutralizing the gatekeeper somehow. And um, there was something about the clinical practice of psychoanalysis that at least for me worked, but that's probably because I had the right kind of neurosis. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I am definitely not going to argue that psychoanalysis as a clinical practice is going to work for everyone. It works for certain types. Of, it can work for certain types of um, uh, symptomatic behavior. Uh, I mean, in Freud's opinion, we were all neurotic in one way or another. And uh, uh, psychoanalysis was not able to reach certain types of neurosis or pathologies like uh, schizophrenia, for instance, or a, a psychotic behavior. But it was very good with hysteria, which most mm. of us are. So, <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean, and so um, <clears throat> it, it can work for, cer for certain types of uh, neurosis and kind of take away uh, the, the rigid, rigidified kind of pathways that we talked about earlier relax uh, the ways in which energy flows in our bodies and in our psyches and just kind of neutralize that gate gatekeeper that has been um, kind of instituted as, uh, as the, the moral compass. compass. And of course, we need that in other aspects of our lives. I don't want to get rid of ethics or anything, but we don't necessarily need it when we are trying to write a book. So getting rid of that uh, super ego, uh, that would be the mm -hmm. psychoanalytic term, getting rid of the superego gatekeeper is exactly the kind of practical advice. But, you know, as to how you do that is a complicated question and, it, and it's <laughs> idiosyncratic to the person who is who is trying to right. trying to accomplish that. OK, good. Um, I have two other topics that I just wanted to touch on. I was going to say briefly, but it might not be brief. We don't need to be brief. The, uh, the airtime okay. is more or less free because they're big topics. One is you've written a lot and thought a lot about mourning, uh, mourning with a U in it, the sense of uh, being sad when something bad happens. And so, uh, I mean, a lot of what we, we've been talking about is sort of implicitly individualistic, like I'm working on my own shit. I can say shit now because you already said fuck. So, uh, <laughs> But then the external world uh, imposes on us also, right? Like bad things happen. People we love and care about die or whatever. Or disasters happen. Um, how does this view of, the, of, of our inner mental landscape help us think about those or even cope with those incidents in our lives? Okay, so that's really a great question. Um, <clears throat> I will talk on two different levels. I said earlier that in my understanding, there are kind of two, dif two different levels of lack or wounding or traumatization, uh, the first being the ontological. And I kind of hesit hesitate to call it traumatizing because, I mean, if it's the human condition, I'm not sure that we should call it trauma. But a lot of people in my field do mm -hmm. um, because it's like linked to this idea that you have somehow been injured mm -hmm. or wounded or uh, Something in you has been murdered by the signifier. Zizek, Slavo Zizek, who has popularized uh, Lacan, uh, often talks about the murder of the thing. Uh, like, and by the thing, he means like something um, um, bio, almost like biological. That, that's a complicated uh, concept that I can certainly talk about, but we don't need to. But okay, so talking on the ontological level, 
uh, when you think about the the idea that uh, there is this lack in our being, a void, then the conclusion, uh, which someone like Julia Kristeva explains really beautifully, is that actually to be a human being is to be a, a being who mourns. We are always already mourning something. We are mourning this loss that has happened to us at a time that we can't recall. Uh, you're right, like, there's no way of actually going back to that time when this loss supposedly happened. But the idea is that we, on some level, mourn it all the time. And so Kristeva has this great quote um, where she says something like, do not look for the meaning in mourning. Understand that there's only meaning because we mourn. Mm. So she's making the point that we are only able to make meaning. We are meaning-making creatures because we do have this lack that we are mourning, and we make meaning in order to try to fill that lack. So that's one level. But then uh, your question was more more targeted to to the other level, the the second level, what I earlier called context specific or circumstantial. When like something really horrible happens to you, and um, and Freud already had a very famous essay called mourning and melancholia, uh, where he distinguished between what he called normal mourning, like if someone dies or, you know, your lover leaves you or something bad happens to you, of course, you're going to be sad uh, potentially for a long time. You could mourn, let, let's say the loss of, lo- loss of your partner, your lover, you could mourn the, that loss for years potentially. But then the idea is that under normal circumstances, eventually you will get to a point where you're able to redirect your desire to a new person. You're able to fall in love again and find a a new relationship. Um, But then with melancholia, which he juxtaposed to mourning, the idea is that you get stuck in your state of mourning. Uh, You're stuck there kind of indefinitely. So it's kind of mourning that doesn't come to an end. And so he thought that that was the more pathological of the two at the same time as he kind of also said, you know, people who are depressed. I mean, I think that uh, the contemporary term for melancholia would be the kind of depression that doesn't have like a clear cause. We can be depressed because of a specific reason or we can be kind of vaguely depressed for no like clear reason. So when he talks about melancholia, I think he's talking about that type of depression and uh, so um, the idea is that you can kind of get stuck in that type of depre- depression that doesn't go anywhere, uh, doesn't leave. And um, so then the idea is, the, uh, the psychoanalytic, again, clinical idea is that when a patient comes in with that type of a paralysis of mourning, where you're not able to move, move from your loss, um, the idea is to get you from a place of melancholic depression to a certain type of movement that would allow you to start the process of mourning that loss that you have experienced and then overcome over time come to the place to a place where you can actually start doing something with your life so that you're no longer stuck in that uh what Kristeva calls the crypt of melancholia hmm. so that you can actually get away from that uh um you know trap of of depression, but uh, and you know cognitive behavioral the- uh, 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 therapy, I know is one way in which people are, are dealing with this. Obviously, drugs, um, antidepressants is the, uh, is a like the go to version of how to deal with this kind of depression in North America, and that's fine. I'm not I'm not opposed to medication at all. Um, but but psychoanalysis is the other other way to deal with it. It's just a much slower way of getting there. But the idea is that you go in as someone who more can't like complete the process of mourning, and hopefully through analysis you come to a place where you can, you can kind of start that process and eventually uh, come to an end that allows you to then to then um, live your life more freely. And maybe part of it is just the realization that, you know, if something terrible has happened to you, the the sort of immediate instinctive reaction that it's all terrible, life is worthless, you know, I can't go on living, this one thing that was was making me go uh, is no longer there. And moving from that sort of perspective to that, well, 
I have a reaction to what happened that is that, and there's reasons why I'm having that reaction, and it's a feature of, of who I am. And so let's let, let's see about how I can adjust things to sort of deal with it in a more productive way. Is that close? Yeah, and I mean, I, I think that <clears throat> at the gist of it is this idea that, I mean, um, Freud called it reality testing. <laughs> so um, when you're in a state of melancholia or like uh, this kind of depression that doesn't go away, you uh, basically don't want to, to acknowledge the fact that this loss has happened to you. Uh, so you kind of keep testing reality and uh, and your your test is not very accurate <laughs> in the sense that it, it gives you back this uh, sense that somehow you are still linked to whatever it is that you have lost. So you often, let's say you're talking about someone you loved uh, whom you have lost, you may fantasize that person into existence. You might actually hallucinate them, like see them on the street. Imagine that you see them when you see someone who vaguely resembles them or something like that. Um, uh, but the idea is that gradually you you keep testing reality and uh, and bit by bit, reality tells you that this loss is real and that you have to deal with it. And, uh, and uh, mourning is a process of decathecting yourself from that object or that person. Um, Catexis is just a fancy term for like being bonded to something mm -hmm. and uh, or being invested in something. And so uh, psychoanalytically, when you are mourning, you're gradually decathecting yourself from whatever it is that you have lost. And uh, the successful process of mourning ideally gets you to a place where you can reinvest yourself, your energy, your psyche onto a new person or new object or new uh, interest, new ideals, even a new country, whatever it is. Um, so yeah, a gradual uh, kind of a decathecting so that you can recathect. <laughs> I can see why this is going to take a long time, uh, the psychoanalytic <laughs> version of, of fixing it, but, but it might be the healthiest way to, to, I don't know, really reorient. I mean, I guess... I, uh, now I'm just way out of my depth. I'm going to get in trouble talking about things I know nothing about. But yeah. I also am completely open to using medication um, when things go wrong, if, it, if it's very, very helpful. Um, and for some people, it's just there's no other way. I mean, there, or there's something wrong, you know, in their balance of endorphins or whatever it is. Um, but if but like we said before, the even the singularity of the individual is not set in stone, right? It can it can change. And if you can sort of reorient who you are in a way to be more accepting and dealing with these terrible tragedies, uh, that might be a more long lasting, robust way to um, cope with them. Yeah, that's definitely the idea. Yeah, um, the idea. Again, so I, I get, uh, also, uh, I'm not opposed to medication, and I do think that there are certain circumstances where people absolutely need medication. But the idea is that uh, um, that analysis, again, can get you to a point where for the rest of your life you have the necessary skill set to deal with any subsequent uh, tragedy or loss or uh, whatever bad things happen to you, so that if you like figure out how to how to deal with it once, uh, um, you in some ways possess the toolbox for doing it again when something new happens to you. I mean, it doesn't always work. I mean, uh, in some instances, a new traumatizing experience can kind of only d deepen the wounds that you have from previous experiences. Yeah. But uh, I know from my own experience that that uh, having been traumatized and having like figured out how to overcome that trauma can help you deal with new traumatization. And I've uh, made this argument strongly in my writing, you know, in like a popular cultural understanding of traumatization, there's often this idea that the traumatized person is very brittle or fragile and can be very easily re-traumatized. And I, I, I always argue that that's not necessarily the case, that in fact, the, the people who have been very traumatized at various points in their lives often possess the, the right tools for dealing with new trauma so that they're actually more agile and more, more kind of capable of coping with new forms of traumatization. And ideally, uh, psychoanalysis would give you those tools and 
uh, I'll just very quickly um, cite a non-Lacanian psychoanalytic theoretician from UChicago, uh, Jonathan Lear, who conceptualizes this as kind of a uh, the kind of rewiring of your whole, whole system, kind of rebooting of your whole system that will kind of redefine your entire destiny. If you think about breaking the repetition compulsion, like really getting down to the level, level of the unconscious and breaking your habitual way of dealing with things when they happen to you, uh, uh, you're really talking about reconfiguring your entire destiny, not in the sense that you are in control of everything that happens to you, but you con- you, re- uh, you reconfigure how you respond to what happens to you, and in so doing, you reconfigure uh, the rest of your life. Um, so, yeah, that's one way to think about it that I have found useful. You know, I, I said we had two topics left, and I was going to do the sadder one first, you know, the more melancholy one, and... Uh, which was mourning, and then we're going to move on to love, which would be the happier one. But now I'm not so sure that love is going to be the happier one. But let, let's do it anyway. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> have we have we solved love? I mean, Plato told us this uh, very fake story about each one of us having a soulmate, and we have to find them, and then once we do, we'll be eternally happy. Uh, that that seems very different than most people's experience. Um, so, what do we learn about love? Uh, and, and even you can say like. Uh, uh, not love of uh, art or anything like that, but love of another person. I mean, what what is the oh. insight we get from that? Okay, so there's there's so much that I could I say know. about that, and <laughs> I, I will try to keep this brief. But I feel like I I should have somehow I should have just led with this because this is as I said how I hook my students. Um, <clears throat> so there are good good news. There are bad news and good news. <laughs> uh, I think Lacan had a very uh, complicated understanding of of romantic love specifically and that's the kind of love uh, love i'm going to be talking about and there are post lacanian thinkers who are very famous like zizek and alain badieu and todd mcgowan uh, who have written a lot about uh, love from a lacanian perspective and so okay so i'll give you the bad news first (laughs) so the idea is that um uh, before that kind of wounding that wounding that happens, and here we are again in the in the realm of mythology, the idea is that before the the wounding that happens to you as a result of language acquisition, um, you are, you are kind of symbiotically at, at, at like a one being with this thing that Lacan called the thing with the capital T. <laughs> Uh, he took it from German dusting okay. and you can think all the way back to Kant, the thing in itself. And, uh, the Lacanian version of the thing actually has direct resonances with, uh, with the Kantian thing in itself and the Heideggerian thing also, uh, something like uh, fundamentally ontological, but also something that has to do with sublimity in the Kantian sense, uh, sense like the sublime, uh, thing. But in this case, the sublime thing is within your being. So, so what, what supposedly happened, this is like co- completely hypothetical and completely mythologic, mythological, but so the idea is that what happens to you is that uh, you kind of lose contact with this thing. And then the thing that you are, oh, that is, it's the thing and the thing, the thing and the thing. The thing that you're looking for for the rest of your life, the object of your desire, the object R, is sort of a piece of this thing with the capital T. Um, and Lacan didn't really have great things to say about this because he basically said, this is the narcissistic scenario mm. where you're just looking for the piece of yourself that you fant- fantasize that you have lost. And uh, I, left a, uh, I left out a really big point earlier, which, which was that he did not think that we actually ever lost anything. When he talks about that lack that we feel... He's very clear about the fact that we haven't actually lost anything in reality. That is a fantasy that we retroactively create about supposedly having lost something really precious. So he's saying, okay, so when you fall in love uh, in this way where you're looking for the, for the little piece of the thing that you think that you have lost, then basically you're just trying to fill your lack in a narcissistic sense. You're just like looking for a reflection of yourself so that you can feel whole again. So he was just like, no, 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 that's not how we should think about love. Um, But then he had this other version, uh, which 
contemporary theorists have distinguished uh, from what I just talked about. They have called what I just talked about romance, like what we understand when we th think about romance in the conventional conventional sense. Uh, and again, like Lacan, they think that that's a bad kind of a narcissistic endeavor that doesn't really get you anywhere. Ultimately, you're going to be disappointed. Your partner's going to let you down because, of course, they're <laughs> never going to be able to be that mirror for you for the rest of your life. You know, you, you're with a person for a year and suddenly there's like a little crack in that mirror and you start questioning that relationship and eventually you'll fall out of love because it was never based on anything that had to do with the person it, uh, it, the other person it, ha it had to do with your desire to to fill your lack so bad 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 <laughs> but then the good version of love um, is linked to what i have characterized as uh, as jouissance um, this kind of a uh, semi-unconscious uh, energy that is coursing through our being. And uh, Lacan had this idea that when you come across a, a person who is able to kind of activate your desire on that level, on a level that is s deeper than your narcissistic quest for self-fulfillment, <laughs> then there's something, then, then there's, there's something, quote-unquote, real, or uh, the real is like a Lacanian concept, um, I will rephrase. There's something "quote unquote" "quote unquote" truthful about that desire, and um, uh, one way to understand that is that, and Todd McGowan is great, uh, great at explaining this. Uh, one way to understand this is that uh, you are basically falling in love with whatever it is that the other is lacking, all the ways in which the other feels dislocated or distorted or alienated or lacking or not enough or whatever, the wounded or injured or whatever, you're basically connecting to the injury in the other. And there's something um, within the Lacanian theory, theoretical world at least, there's something about that type of love that actually is like the real thing. And uh, Badieu, uh, Alain Badieu, he's a con who's a contemporary French philosopher, theorizes uh, uh, the so-called love event. He talks about falling in love in this particular way as an event that completely reconfigures your life so that there's no way for you to go back to living your life the way that you used to live before you met the person that kind of derailed you. And it's, a, it's very much a derailing, derailing kind of a, uh, a moment. Uh, it's not a happy-go-lucky kind of like, oh, I really like this person type of a, an experience. It's like a completely derailing, uh, like uh, lightning sort of, the lightning strikes you type of uh, experience. And it can actually be traumatizing in some ways. Mm. But once it happens, there's kind of no coming back from that experience and that that person is going to have a certain hold on you, um, potentially for a very long time, which also means that they have the immense capacity to hurt you if they decide to leave you or sure. otherwise wound you. Um, if you're like, if you're connected, bonded on that very deep level, then someone can really destroy you. And you have to be open to that happening. Yeah. So the, the ideally, uh, if you want to have quote unquote true or real love, you would have to be completely open to this happening. Uh, uh, if you're afraid of getting hurt, you kind of can't uh, get the good part. Uh, yeah. So yeah, it's a it's a it's a difficult dilemma for many people, which is why a lot of people say uh, stay on the level of kind of like safe romance that has been sort of socially um, almost uh, pre-programmed for them. Like you know what to do. You go on a date and then you buy a certain kind of gift and then you do this and then you do that. And it's it's kind of a safe model of love. Um, and eventually, after a year and a half, you get married or at least engaged or whatever. Um, and that's very different from like allowing yourself to be derailed by this this encounter with utter otherness in the sense that you can never really access the interiority of another person completely. You'll never know exactly what it is that you're dealing with. Like yourself, the other is always in a process of evolving and mutating and, and coming a different person. So you also have to keep up with who they are coming at the same time as you are becoming something else. Uh, so it's very complicated and not necessarily at all uh, reassuring. 
I just want to get on the the record here that uh, I'm very fond of my narcissistic quest for self fulfillment, and I don't want you bad mouthing <laughs> that. This is an important part of my life. <laughs> but uh, <Okay>. yeah. <laughs> but so I, I and the other but the other thing was uh, more going. That was just a joke. The 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 thing that fits in very well with my experience is I know people who have it's even possible I've done this myself, but papered over the memory of it. Uh, people who failed in romance because they were too rigid in what was supposed to happen at what moment in time, right? Like this thing we're doing is supposed to happen on the third date, not on the fourth date or, or whatever it is. And that's clearly not a very healthy way to go about it. I mean, you made the, when we were emailing back and forth uh, to get ready for this, you made the crack that uh, r- that Lacanians think of romance as just a capitalist plot in some way. It's it's not really getting at the essence of love, right? Exactly. So uh, again, Todd McGowan uh, uh, theorizes this beautifully because he's very interested in capitalism. He has a whole chapter on love in his book, Capitalism and Desire, which is a recent book. Um, uh, highly accessible to non-specialists. I really recommend it. Um, but yeah, he he argued very he argues very convincingly that in our culture we have this notion of romantic love that follows uh, very particular types of steps that are linked to uh, basically capitalistic uh, modes of of um, uh, like generating profit. So mm. it's. Uh, it's premised on things like fancy dinners and, uh, you know, uh, nice gifts and Valentine's Day, bouquets of flowers and boxes of chocolate and ev- eventually like a really fancy engagement ring. And then like the wedding dress that costs thousands of dollars and then the fancy wedding and all of that. And he's just basically saying, yeah, this is like uh, how capitalism <laughs> has co-opted love and Real love actually has nothing to do with this. Sure. Real love is something that would completely derail you and w- would kind of, I mean, I'm not saying that there's anything wrong with having a wonderful, beautiful wedding like you had, but uh, it, the idea would be that you would not necessarily need that in order to to feel that the love that you have for another person is real and genuine and enduring and all of those things. Uh, so yeah, it would be a derailing experience rather than this kind of let's follow the steps kind of thing. And for a lot of people, it can be very difficult to get away from the step type of thinking uh, insofar as they have been sort of socialized into a specific yeah. uh, way of being a person. And of course, the whole point of Lacanian thinking is to destroy how society has taught you to be a person and be open to other ways of experiencing life and love and relationships and yourself and your lack and all of that. So if I were to try to dramatically oversimplify what you said, so you can you can tell me how wrong this is, but the, the message I'm getting is that there is a sort of mistaken or doomed way of thinking about love in this kind of platonic sense where you have a lack, so you find someone who fills the lack. And there's this more uh, rewarding version of love where... We both have lacks, but our lacks are complementary and work together. Like, let's find a, you know, a, a, the, the successful couple is the one who lack together. That's a really good way of putting it. Absolutely. Yeah. So even though I have, like, uh, throughout this podcast, I have valorized this notion of lack in some ways, uh, I want to be very clear about the fact that Lacan was very, very uh, critical of the idea that uh, you can use another person to sort of pluck your your lack and make yourself whole. Um he was not happy with that idea and tried to get his patients away from that um, from that way of thinking. And also, um, I mean, as a, as part of doing that, uh, and this is why also another reason he's not very popular with American clinicians. He wanted to destroy your ego. That's a long story, but he really did not like the ego. Um, so he wanted to get away from nurse, narcissistic ways of being in the world. And I understand your defense of narcissism. I think that all of us <laughs> need some of it. Uh, I certainly am kind of pro-narcissism in the sense that I feel like I started my life you know, in a place where my narcissistic understanding of myself had been completely destroyed. And then I had to mm. rebuild it from scratch. Yeah. So I'm in the camp of 
of the people who believe that we all need a certain healthy degree of narcissism. Narcissism, but Lacan really hated narcissism, so he was really not uh, keen on the idea that you you use another person to fill your lack. But you're absolutely right about the complementarity of two different singular lacks, and this is why one reason our like genuine desire is so idiosyncratic and so specific. Uh, that only very few people in the world can really truly fulfill our our desire. Like uh, in one of my books, I say something like, you know, when I walk into the subway car, say in Boston, the, the really crowded subway car, there, there's rarely anyone I want to sleep with. <laughs> like it's really hard to find a person I really want to sleep with. I mean, I can go through like thousands of people and not want to sleep with any of them. And then one person comes along and suddenly it's like, oh, yeah. This person, this this person will do. They work, yeah. And there's something, yeah, there's something, some complementary, something going on, and I don't understand it myself. It's a, it's enigmatic, and um, Lacan very much emphasized the fact that this objet ah, the cause of your desire, is very enigmatic. You don't necessarily know what it is in the other person that is calling upon you or is like summoning you to to this relationship but there is something there it's just that you don't know what it is um and if you allow yourself to follow the thread of that you might get to something that would be very genuine and um very derailing and difficult uh, but also very genuine and and kind of growth inducing you know, I always like to end the podcast on an optimistic note. And and despite all expectations, I think we reached it right there. Something uh, genuine and growth inducing and um, dealing with our disequilibria in various productive ways. So, Mari Rudy, thanks so much for being on the Mindscape podcast. Thank you, Sean Carroll. <laughs> <laughs> My good friend. Thank you so much. This has My been pleasure. fun.